awesome. That's much better. Thank you, my dear. <laughs> Thanks. Well, good evening. I can't see you, but I'm hoping you can see me here. Um, my name is Dominic, and uh, I'm a grateful Christian in recovery um, from sexual addiction, lust, and pornography. And, good evening. Um, so would you join me in a short prayer? Uh, Father God, we thank you for your amazing, endless love. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. Most of all, Father, I thank you for never giving up on me. As I share my story, Lord, I pray that it may inspire others to seek the same life-changing power that I have come to know through the love and glory of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So, my story begins um, in the middle of World War II, because that's when I was born. And I was raised in a, an era when uh, children were taught to be seen but not heard. My mom was a strong advocate for the cliche, spare the rod and spoil the child. She also had an uncontrollable temper when she got angry. She would use anything that was at hand to deliver her punishment, and it didn't really matter where those strikes landed. My dad was a hardworking, proud man and a very good provider, uh, often working two jobs. He, however, was not very nurturing. He felt that for a male to show any form of emotion, especially crying, was a sign of weakness. This was a terrible conflict for me. As a young child, I was very sensitive and full of emotion. I always felt like I was a disappointment to him. He seldom had time to spend with us. He, and I often felt alone and unloved. And to this day, I can never remember my parents saying what I wanted to hear the most. Just to hear the words, I love you, would have made everything else all right. I often entered into a world of fantasy where my dad would spend time having fun with us and my mom would not be angry all the time. And it was in this world that I had found an escape. My parents did teach us good things like honesty, respect, and the virtues of hard work. They also sent my brother and I to church, although they did not go with us. We were Roman Catholic, and I learned there was a God, and he had a son named Jesus. But I never understood much about church or God. In church, I hated the ritual. The service was in a foreign language I did not understand. And on top of that, I had the attention span of a gerbil. I did, however, learn that God was powerful and that he could answer prayers. And as I grew up, I would turn to God when things in my life went wrong. To me, he became my God of crisis. However, when the crisis ended, so did my search for God. This became a pattern that followed me throughout my life. Somewhere around the age of eight, my fantasy world began to change. We had a babysitter. I really liked her. She would spend time doing things with us and playing games. I don't remember a lot about her, but I clearly recall what happened one evening when we played a new kind of a game. That night, I learned that there was a definite difference between boys and girls. I knew something was wrong, but I, it didn't frighten me. Um, someone was paying attention to me, and I actually felt loved. After that, she suddenly stopped babysitting us, and I never saw her again. I did, however, think of her often. I was too young to understand sex, and I conceived a misguided conception that intimate contact and affection meant love and acceptance. From then on, my fantasy world changed. I now had a new place in my mind to forget the pain. Around the age of 12, more changes began to take place in my life. Things I... If things just felt different, and my fantasies began to take on new meanings. I was also introduced to pornography. Um, during the next four years, I also experienced real sexual situations. Most of these were uh, unwanted, and sometimes I was even forced. In school, I had always been bullied and would often come home crying. Another disappointment to my dad. 
One day I decided that if I was going to survive, I would have to fight back. So I began to learn how to box. I boxed in the, in the ring, I boxed in the street, and eventually in the Navy. I would fight every chance I got, and my fighting turned into rebellion. I rebelled against everything. My parents, my teachers, school, church, and especially bullies. All I wanted to do was fight. I refused to do my homework and began to fail, repeating seventh grade twice and eighth grade three times. I also met a girl at age of 12 that I was crazy about. She did not like me or my constant fighting. So I began to settle down, but it took two years of being persistent before she decided to give me a chance. At the age of 16, I got my first job. I saved every penny I made, and I bought her an engagement ring. At 17, I dropped out of school, and I joined the Navy. But we set a date to get married when I completed boot camp. So on January 2nd, 1962, I married the girl I fell in love with at the age of 12. The next day, we boarded a train to Chicago to begin our life together. I began to stretch over, or stress I'm sorry, over our situation. We had um, all of our belongings with us, only $50 in cash, and no place to live when we arrived. She sensed my concern, squeezed my hand, and said, it'll be okay. We are together. At age, excuse me, I'm sorry. At age 19, I became a father to our first child, and we had a son. 17 months later, our second child was born. And we now had a daughter, the perfect family. And I wish I could say that we stayed that way, but this perfection had a flaw, and that was me. After being discharged from the service, I found life a struggle. I was a father with two babies. I had dropped out of school with only an eighth grade education. But I took the first job that was offered at a minimum wage. I had to take a second job, and my wife had to go to work as well. I was also frustrated and felt like a failure. This became a real problem as I had never really let go of my fantasy world. Worse, I began to rely on it more and more. I did eventually gain some success financially when I got into the construction business. Um, I worked hard during a time when companies cared more about results than your education. And I worked my way into management and began to make a decent wage. This should have made things better, but it actually worked against me. I now had more time and money to retreat into my world of fantasy. I seldom gave a thought to God. I did not have a crisis. My life became filled with lust. Pornography had graduated to full nudity. Hardcore porn, nude dance clubs, and adult bookstores were everywhere. I became more and more engulfed in the darkness of this world. And I did not see it then, but I had become a sex addict. I was now married for over 10 years, and up until now, there was one line that I had not crossed. I had not had sex with another woman, but that was about to change. One day I met a young woman that was quite willing to take my flirting to the next level. And sadly, I accepted her invitation. It turned out to be not a one-time fling, but it became an affair. My simple world was now complete, and it wasn't long before my wife knew I had a mistress. I thought she would certainly divorce me. My life was definitely in a crisis. I did not want a divorce, and I begged her for another chance and promised both her and God that I would end that relationship and never do it again. My God of crisis was listening, and my wife did forgive me. After about a year, began, things began to t- return to normal, and the crisis was over. The problem was normal for me. It was returning to my world of lust, pornography, fantasy, and flirting. Well, you guessed that it. it wasn't long before the opportunity came knocking again. And once again, I answered. And this time, it was even worse. Not only did the affair last for three years, but I left home to go live 
with her. I did not have to seek God. He knew that my life was in a crisis, and he found a way to let me know. When I left, I wrote a letter to my wife telling her I was sorry, that I would always love her, and that I didn't know how, but somehow and someday we would be together again. Well, I don't remember making a draft of that letter, but apparently I did. My new roommate soon found it and decided I should go home. I was lost in my own self-made misery and definitely in a crisis mood. I called on God and promised I would stop my evil ways if he would just help me fix this. So I called my wife and she agreed to talk. The pain that I had caused her had taken a toll and was very physically visible. I never felt so horrible or disgusted with myself. My wife, in spite of it all, said I could come home, and I wondered why, but I realized the answer. She, too, had many hurts from her childhood. She grew up in a broken home, and she would do anything to keep her family together. Well, this should have been a wake-up call that ended my infidelity, but it wasn't. Over the next 10 years, the pattern repeated itself again and again. I think my wife just became numb to it. My children despised me for what I had put her through. My son, in particular, grew angry and distant. Finally, I don't know how, but I just stopped. I hated myself, and I knew I had to stop hurting people I loved. I again turned to God, and again he was there. God did listen to my prayers and gave me a chance to make amends to her. I spent the next 10 years loving her the way I should have. But what I had no way of knowing was that God had already made plans to rescue her. On January 25th, 1997, and after three years of fighting ovarian cancer, her, her battles were over. She passed away as I held her in my arms. Well, I was devastated and more of a crisis than ever before in my life. For the first time, I was alone. I mean, really alone. I had lost my best friend, and I knew I would never see her again. I hated myself for all the time I have spent with her, had not spent with her, and chose, could have spent with her, and chose not to. I'm sorry. I'm having a hard time seeing here. I spent the last month taking care of her. She was on hospice and needed 24 hours care. The only place I felt any peace was at the cemetery, talking to her and God. I went there every day for nine months. I started going to church, and I thought I would never return to my old habits. I was once again wrong. Feeling alone and hurt, I again returned to my old world to escape the pain. And the next 10 years just seemed like a blur. My wife told me not to be alone, that I should find somebody that I could be happy with. I had several failed attempts and spent much of my time back in fantasy land. With the arrival of the Internet, pornography had grown in leaps and bounds. It was available 24 hours a day. It was free, and I didn't even have to leave home. Perfect. I didn't see anything wrong with it. I wasn't hurting anyone. I was totally blinded and did not see God anywhere. I did not look for him. I did not have a crisis. One day, quite by accident, I met a beautiful young lady, and I found out she liked to fish, and that was my favorite sport. I was 17 years or elder, and I jokingly told her if I was 20 years younger, I'd marry her. Apparently, she didn't take it as a joke because four months later, I found myself standing next to her taking wedding vows. That moment was bittersweet, especially when it came to hearing the words, until death do you part, I froze. She understood, and she squeezed my hand. I managed to swallow the lump in my throat and get through the words. I knew then that God had blessed me with not only one, but two wonderful women in my life. As I looked at her, I knew I never wanted to see a hurt look in her eyes, like that look that still haunted me from my past. 
The first year and a half was like a dream. It was perfect. I was married to a beautiful woman, and we were living here in paradise. Life, however, does have a way of changing things. A year and a half into our new life, tragedy struck. Her youngest daughter had come to live with us, and she was a very troubled young lady that was addicted to prescription drugs. Shortly after her 21st birthday, she found my gun, went into the bathroom, and ended her life. After that, things changed. My wife started to withdraw. I could feel her pain and tried to talk to her about it. But she just would just say, I just have to deal this, with this in my own way. Over the next five years, she became increasingly distant. And once again, I turned to my world of porn and lustful fantasy. And one day, the inevitable happened, and I took that horrible, disastrous step that, into that world that I vowed I would never again enter. This time, I broke the pattern. It was not a long, drawn-out affair, but a short one-time incident. I knew it would only be a short time before my wife found out. I did not want her to hear it from someone else. I had to tell her. When I again saw that horrifying look of pain on the face of someone I loved, it was more than I could bear. I just wanted to die. I just wanted it to end. I felt like I was a horrible person and that I would never change. I did not deserve to live. Somehow, as it turned out, my daughter happened to be visiting us and she realized something was terribly wrong. She also knew what I was about to do. And she told me, I just can't believe that you would put her through that again. As it turned out, my wife was willing to forgive me and stay with me, but they both told me I needed to get help. I wasn't sure where to go or what to do, but I too agreed with them, so I turned to, once again to the computer, and, I, and this time God was guiding my search. I kept coming back to the site called Celebrate Recovery. I had an overwhelming feeling that God was leading me there, so I went. I was so nervous as I went to my first meeting. I was told to give it six weeks, and I went the second week. And when that came, I was even more nervous as I entered a room um, with other men to talk about our sexual addiction. I was a mess, and I couldn't imagine talking to others about my past. I was different. No one was as sinful as I, and I didn't deserve forgiveness. I was full of shame and guilt, and no one, not even God, would forgive the sins of my past. In coming weeks, I had listened to others share their stories, and I began to see I wasn't so different. I was not alone in my sinful nature. I still didn't feel comfortable talking about my past or that I would ever be forgiven. But then one day, I came across this scripture, Isaiah 118. It says, Jesus says, come, let's talk this over. No matter how deep the stains of your sin, I can take them out and make you white as newly fallen snow. Even if they are as red as crimson, I can make you white as wool. In these words, I found a glimmer of hope. I desperately come to them, and I repeated them every day. This was the first breakthrough in my recovery, and, it did, and I did keep coming back. That was over five years ago. Since then, God has blessed me in so many ways. He has brought me back from the brink of death, not only in this life, but from eternal death. I no longer hate who I am. Uh, having worked through the 12 steps, I learned to forgive myself and believe in Romans 8.1. It says, therefore, there is no condemnation in, for those in Christ Jesus. Through CR, I have found a new family in a new way of living. I start each day reading online devotions, reflecting in my journal, and spending time, quiet time with God. I have an amazing sponsor. Um, I, I can never express enough gratitude for his friendship and guidance. I would have not made it through steps four and five without him. And I just can't say enough about having a good sponsor in recovery. Today, my sponsor and I are, uh, are good friends as well, and he is still my sponsor. Thank you, Jim. 
I have learned. I have learned to turn away from my sinful behavior as a way of dealing with life. I now turn to God's words and promises for comfort and peace. For the first time in my life, my life has real meaning and a purpose. I am at peace with my wife, my family, and most importantly, God. I have also learned the importance of giving back and serving God. I've had the privilege of sponsoring 11 people. I have served on the jail ministry team and the leadership team here at Grace. I facilitate our men's small group on Friday nights. And God is no longer my God of crisis. He's now my God of hope, my God of peace, and my God of salvation. Most recently, I have had the most powerful display of God's mercy and his salvation. Early this July, both my wife and I were diagnosed with COVID. I've never had so many different types of symptoms, especially all at the same time. The worst by far was the intensity of the pain throughout my entire body. I couldn't even begin to describe it, but I was sure that I wasn't going to survive it. Moreover, I didn't even care. I actually prayed to God, telling him I was ready. I was ready for him to call me home. And would welcome it if he would. At the height of my agony, God answered me. I recalled Philippians 1.6. God said, I am not done with you yet. They say, whatever doesn't kill you will make you stronger. I find a great deal of truth in this. When it comes to being stronger as a result of surviving COVID, I had to look at what that meant. Was I physically stronger? I can assure you I am not. In fact, I tested negative for COVID. Or right after I tested negative for COVID, I got pneumonia as an after effect. Am I mentally stronger? Uh, no, not by any stretch of the imagination. What am I, however, is spiritually stronger? By the mercy of God, I have been spared, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, I have been renewed. I have also renewed my commitment to, his, to this strength to help others find peace in our Lord Jesus. My greatest joy comes from sharing his word and giving hope to others. In closing, I pray that my testimony will be an inspiration to anyone that struggles with pain of any addiction. I once heard it said that the reason old people read the Bible so much is because they're cramming for the finals. Well, I can relate to that, my friends, and I urge you, do not wait until you have to have to cram for the finals. Start your own journey of recovery now, and if you're already on this journey, embrace it with all your heart. The rewards are greater than you could ever imagine. My name is Dominic, and I thank you for letting me share.